Okay, I think we'll make a start. Thank you. So welcome. My name is Toby Parks, so I head up the energy and sustainability work at the Behavioural Insights team. Welcome to this session on sustainable diets. Um, before I introduce this fantastic panel, I just wanted to give a bit of context and start with a bit of a history lesson. Because ultimately, the story of humanity has for a long time been one of food and of climate, but we often, I think, forget that fact. So around 12,000 years ago, at the end of the last glacial period, we entered a period of uncommon stability in global temperatures, known as the Holocene. So humans, no different biologically from us today, were around for best about 200,000 years previously, hunting, gathering, living a nomadic existence. But it was only this gift of a temperate and stable climate that actually allowed us to settle, to form populous civilizations, and of course to domesticate crops and animals. So the entirety of human history, or recorded human history, starting in the beginning of agriculture about 9000 BC, right the way through to the modern day, and every well-known civilization in between, has actually been within that sort of fleeting and clement period. Um, and the crucial fact that I think is really mentioned is that actually that sudden success as a species was entirely down to the fact that we could suddenly grow food and therefore settle and populous, become more populous. So in other words, our success is utterly dependent on the climate. But the climate's once again changing. So as we know, a warming world brings risks of more extreme weather, acidified, acidified oceans, regional biodiversity collapse, and so on. And ultimately, potentially, the disruption of the established farming systems, which we now utterly depend upon. Beyond climate change, our profligate use of resources and the pollutants produced in the process pose several other environmental threats. Deforestation, habitat loss, species extinction, freshwater scarcity, pollution, ocean eutrophication, etc., and so alongside energy production, industry and transport, the agricultural system is clearly a major and sometimes the dominant contributor to these environmental challenges. And within the agricultural system, animal production in particular, meat, beef, lamb, etc., uh, are particularly impactful. So clearly impacts vary greatly across regions and across production techniques, but here's a few stats for you from a global perspective. So our food is responsible for roughly a quarter of global emissions, uh, more than half of that is from meat and dairy, and cattle alone are responsible for around 9% of global greenhouse gas emissions. In other words, they're responsible for around or just over a third of the emissions from the food system, and yet they contribute about 1% to our global calorie intake. Uh, we also know that beef and lamb are incredibly water-intensive, so a kilo of beef takes many thousands of litres of water in its production, around about 50 times that of potentially alternatives uh, that are plant-based. Um, agricultural expansion for livestock production is also the leading cause of deforestation, and an area the size of Panama is lost to livestock production every year. That means more carbon emissions, more habitat loss, biodiversity loss, soil degradation, and so on. And, of course, it's bad for our health as well. So red meat, heavy diets are a major cause of cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and bowel cancer. So there are many more facts and figures we could cite, but thankfully it is becoming a fairly well-trodden story now. People are becoming increasingly aware of the issues of profligate um, meat consumption in particular and other products as well. So the question is what's being done? So some consumers are themselves starting to adopt low-meat diets. Um, for instance, supermarket sales figures in the UK paint a fairly positive picture over the last few years, um, and indeed across other parts of the EU as well. Um, but these increases are obviously from a fairly low baseline. Uh, and, of course, much of the world, in particular across parts of Asia and Africa, uh, is still radically increasing its meat consumption as incomes rise and as populations increase. So the total demand for meat is still expected to go up significantly, around about 74% increase by 2050. So more action is clearly needed. Uh, some progressive governments are starting to put the issue on their agenda. For example, Germany has recently at least hinted at discussing the idea of a meat tax. Uh, the UK, whilst we don't have any concrete policies on this at the moment, there is uh, a food strategy on its way. I don't know what's going to come through that. But the CCC, that is the Committee on Climate Change, uh, has at least included an explicit recommendation to reduce meat consumption in the UK through to 2050, or about 20% on beef and lamb. So this is a step in the right direction. The fact that this is entering our political debate, I think, is a good sign. But clearly, there's much more to be done. But it is a timely moment. So I think as behavioral scientists, we need to consider what we can do to support and accelerate that transition. And in my mind, there are at least two major things that we can do here. So firstly, we need to think about what works. So what interventions are effective, whether that's taxes, nudges, awareness campaigns, or whatever. What does the evidence say actually works? 
And secondly, how can policy be made more effectively? Assuming this issue does remain contentious for some time, assuming not all consumers will like being told what they can eat, by government or otherwise, behavioural science can help us navigate those questions of consent, acceptability, etc. So these are broadly the two topics we want to focus on today. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our panel. So from your right to left, we have Professor Dane Theresa Marteau, Director of the Behaviour and Health Research Unit at the University of Cambridge, also Fellow and Director of Studies in Psychological and Behavioural Sciences at Christ College, Cambridge. So undoubtedly, Theresa is a leading academic in the field of uh, psychology, behaviour and health, um, in particular, I think, looking at diet change as well as physical activity, tobacco use, alcohol consumption and so on. And our research focuses primarily on three issues, I think all of which are really relevant to us today. Firstly, the design and evaluation of interventions to promote health behaviours, obviously many of which are translatable to the sustainability space. Secondly, risk communication and how merely communicating risk often fails to change behaviour. And thirdly, public acceptability of policy interventions to change behaviour. So we're going to be covering a lot of those topics later today. Secondly, we have Kerry McCarthy, MP for Bristol East. Uh, Kerry was first elected in 2005. Prior to taking office, she worked as a lawyer on political campaigns. She's also a member of the Environmental Audit and Environmental Food Rural Affairs Select Committee uh, and chairs the Agroeconomy uh, All-Party Parliamentary Group. Um, previously, you've also served as Labour's Shadow Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, involved in all manner of initiatives and charities in your local community. Uh, and I think importantly for today, also, I believe, the first vegan MP uh, in the House of Commons as well and have been it's for a long now, time. You got that first. You were in... Be yes. Before it was cool, yeah. Um, next up, we have Sue Pritchard, Director of the RSA Food, Farming and Countryside Commission, uh, whose recent reports are certainly well worth a read if anyone hasn't yet come across them. And really, I guess they present a range of arguments and policy recommendations around themes of healthy food being everybody's business, uh, farming being potentially a force for positive change, uh, and, and ensuring that we have a countryside that works for all. Uh, and her background is in leading large-scale change uh, for more sustainable futures. Um, and before joining the RSA, Sue put her talents to a wide range of critical issues, including gender balance and diversity inclusion in government. Uh, I believe you also run an organic livestock farm and charity in Wales, which is fantastic and very relevant to us today. And then finally, we have Sophie Atwood, Senior Behavioural Scientist from the Better Buying Lab at the World Resources Institute. Um, so specifically within the Better Buying Lab, um, the work there is focusing on working with industry partners to develop research and scale initiatives to promote sustainable diets. Um, I believe you also earned your doctorate at the University of Cambridge in 2016, and have previous experience working in healthcare um, as well as well-being sectors in the UK and internationally. So clearly an incredibly talented uh, and highly relevant panel for today's discussion. So the way it's going to work uh, is this. We will be using Slido. Um, fingers crossed we won't have too many technical issues. I'm guessing a lot of you are somewhat familiar with Slido already from previous <laughs> sessions. But we're not just going to be using this for questions. We're going to be using it for audience polls throughout the session. So to get the most out of this, I really do encourage you to use Slido. So if you want to take a few moments now to open it, um, you can either do that through the BX app, or you can just go to www.sli.do and enter D265 uh, into the event code. It should only take a moment. Um, as you probably know by now, you select the room, which is the more room in this instance, and then if you go to polls, you should see the polls, but you'll only see them when we uh, hit them to make them live one at a time. So maybe to see if that works, let's start off with a quick poll. The first one being, what do you think the biggest impact will come from, from this range of potentially uh, you know, fairly well uh, uh, trodden intervention types. Should we be tackling stereotypes around plant-based food, including gender norms, to create new norms? Should we be taxing red meat? Should we be introducing eco-labels on all foods? Should we be nudging more sustainable choices through supermarket layouts, restaurant menus, and canteen choice architecture? Should we be raising public awareness and concern through campaigns and education? Should we be developing and promoting more plant-based meat substitutes, like the Impossible Burger, for example, or indeed maybe none of the above? I wasn't going to put all of the above because I thought everyone would just select that. Um, so can everybody see that? I hope so. There's some clicking going on. So if you want to vote and um, if the AV crew maybe want to transition to the live results as they come in, we'll see what people say. Interesting.
Okay, that is interesting. So we've got a lot of votes for the sort of choice architecture nudge type approach. I imagine that might be somewhat down to the interests of the audience. Um, but I think Theresa might be happy with that. There's a lot of work she does in that space. Uh, okay, well, let's move on to the first question. So what we're going to do, we're going to have a series of sort of launching questions for the panel. They're going to respond to those questions either just through a few minutes of discussion or some of them have chosen to do a sort of mini presentation in response to those questions. We'll then sort of follow up with some follow-up questions and so on. We're probably not going to have time for loads of audience Q&A, but I will say all of the questions in this and the follow-up questions are based on your suggestions. Hopefully many of you would have seen I sent out a poll uh, a couple of weeks ago canvassing you for suggested questions. That said, if you do have any burning questions, feel free to submit them in Slido, and if we've got a bit of time at the end, we'll try and get through a few of those. But question number one. So in response to that, you know, are the audience correct, essentially? How do we create behavior change interventions that are both sustainable over time and across populations? So I think we'll start off uh, with Theresa, if you want to come and respond to that. Thanks. OK, thanks very much, Toby. Um, there is no one way of changing behavior, but there are more and less effective ways and traditionally, um, the approach has been to try to change people's minds, to present information, to persuade them to change their behaviour. And this can be very effective. It depends on the nature of the threat. So, as you can see on the far right-hand side, that is incredibly effective um, and actually gets from the gene pool those who can't read or don't uh, heed those warnings. So when the threat is immediate and incompatible with life, we're very sensitive to information. Where it's less effective is where the threat is not immediate and it is compatible with life. And those are the kinds of threats that Toby has been talking about. So the threat often isn't big enough to shift people's behaviour. And even where people intend to change their behaviour, as uh, this is preaching to the choir, um, it's the environment. It's our environment, our situations, that have a very strong effect on our behaviour. And psychologists have known this for decades. And we also know that the environment, the cues in our environment, often without our awareness, have a much stronger impact on our behaviour than even the people at this conference give it credit for. So that's not to say that giving information is not something we shouldn't be doing. We should be doing that because it can increase awareness. And we'll come on to see how increasing awareness can shift behaviour of policymakers. So the focus now is very much on the promise from changing environments around us. And I just want to say quite simply that... There is no accepted typology of environments. It's a word that means different things to different people. But we can think about ourselves as any one moment inhabiting multiple overlapping environments. So, for instance, in this room, there's a physical environment, uh, which is affecting whether you're sitting or standing. There's also a digital environment that many of you are engaged in at any one time. So the key point is that there are cues in all those environments that singly and together are shaping our behaviour. And the big challenge now is to, uh, through research, to examine the cues that have the largest effect on our sustainable behaviour that um, could be used to change our behaviour for good. Thank you. Fantastic. So we do have a few follow-up questions to that, but I think before we go to the follow-up questions, what I'm going to do is go straight to the second sort of key question, because um, there's a bit of overlap here, and then we'll do some follow-up questions in a moment. So that second question is, what specifically can industry do? And when I, when I say industry, I mean supermarkets, suppliers, restaurants, retailers, etc., in order to encourage sustainable diets. So Sophie, if you want to come up and respond to that. So thanks, Toby. So this question is one um, that we at the Better Buying Lab have been researching quite um, consistently over the last couple of years. Um, the Better Buying Lab is a programme within the global think tank um, World Resources Institute, which looks at sustainability issues. Um, and what we do is we work to combine insights from three disciplines, marketing, behavioural science and business strategy, um, to design 
behaviour change interventions that can encourage more sustainable um, consumption practices and we work very closely with the food industry who are partner with us they help set our research agenda and they also provide us with um, an applied test bed that we can go test our interventions in and see if they work in real life it's just a bit of context I'm sorry I've got cold that's why I sound terrible so um, since the middle of last year we've been quite concertedly trying to find out um, what the best approach is that industry can use to go about shifting diners to more sustainable um, consumption habits. And what we're looking at specifically is a shift away from ruminant meat um, towards more plant-based diets. And kind of having a look at the literature, what we realised was we, we need, really needed a bit of a roadmap to understand all the different potential interventions that are available um, to apply in food service. So we engaged in a scoping review and also an industry consultation process which we've been doing over about the last six to 12 months where we were trying to map out the full range of different interventions that were available to shift behaviour. At the end of the process we found 57 potential behaviour change techniques across the range and what we've done actually is cluster these into five categories and that we're calling the 5P framework and they're in subgroups here. Um, which, and then we're using this really as a guide to help set our research agenda. 57 is quite a lot, and we're hoping to feed this information back to industry so it can help um, stimulate implementation and further research. So I'm not sure if you can see this, but what we've tried to do from that list of 57 is get to a short list of the best bet interventions that will work best for food service. Um, rather than rely on the evidence that's available in the literature to do this, which at the moment is quite scant, we found about 15 research papers that have looked at shifting diets, which is not really enough um, to base our decisions on. We actually went to um, a sample of about 70 food industry representatives and asked them of the list of 57 techniques, which ones they thought were the best, which ones they thought were effective and which they thought were feasible to use in their own um, operations and we've charted their responses on this graph here the area that we're particularly interested in this is top right hand quadrant these are the intervention techniques that across the sample of industry representatives they thought were particularly effective and that were easy to implement in their own operations so these are kind of the low-hanging fruit that we'd like to focus more work on if you're interested in the, the best and the worst, I've listed them here. That little cluster in the top right-hand corner is the top three highest scorers. Um, these were a combination of product-based strategies, which is about changing the food itself, or presentation strategies, which is looking at menu engineering approaches. So um, the ones that they thought were best were reducing the amount of meat in a dish, so cutting portion size, um, or improving the plant-based foods themselves, improving the flavour and texture. And they're also pretty keen on um, a technique of how you um, descriptive language that you use for plant-based foods. So we're trying to selectively sell the benefits of plant-based. Interestingly, the bottom left-hand cluster, same types of techniques, so both presentation and product. Um, and I... My kind of take home from this is the types of techniques that industry don't really like are ones that are restrictive, which makes sense. They weren't keen on the idea of um, default plant-based menus where people don't get a choice and also anything that was a bit naff. <laughs> so they weren't keen on interventions like adding natural Im images to menus or introducing special utensils or packaging. Um, so that's kind of an overall map of what's, what works. And just if you're curious about the other 23 interventions in the list, the shortlist, they're listed here. I think the key take home from this really is um, industry are quite keen on interventions that are focused on the product. They're also very keen on interventions that, that um, draw in their staff and engage their staff in creating a change. And this is quite interesting in the context of most of the behaviour change literature, where a lot of it's focused actually on these promotion techniques. Um, so that this includes things like posters, labelling, um, pricing strategies. So at the moment, there seems to be a bit of split in terms of what people are researching and what industry says that they want and think will work best. Okay. So. Thank you. And as a sort of perfect follow-up to that, Tracy, you had a, a particular study that you wanted to highlight along a similar vein, I believe. Two. Two, two sorry, two studies. Uh, results from two studies. And actually, it's interesting hearing what you've just presented, Sophie, because can we go back... Yes, by all means. Um, one. So in your top three, um, I would add above your top one the intervention that I'm now going to talk about, which is... Uh, 
and it is the intervention for which there is most evidence, which isn't a lot, but it's, uh, I'm going to present the results of two, two sets of field trials, one conducted over six months, one conducted over 12 months, which it's a slight nuance on what you've heard about. It's increasing the relative availability of the target food. So it's increasing the proportion of meals offered that are plant-based and reducing the proportion of meals that are meat or fish-based. So it sounds like, um, so the important thing is we have an absence of evidence on increasing the absolute number of vegetarian meals if you don't take away the meat and the fish. So um, just to bear in mind, uh, that's what I'm going to be talking about. And as I said, there is no one effective intervention. And I'm sure all of these are going to do something. But at the moment, what we need to be focused on, where are we going to get the biggest effects? So I'm going to present the results of two field studies. The first one um, is looking at increasing the availability of healthier, i.e. less energy-dense food. And it's based on the same principles. And as behavioural scientists, what we're interested in is evidence that is coming from sort of slightly different foci, but is still relevant to what we want to do. So this is a paper uh, uh, which is already published, and it looked at an intervention for five months across six worksite cafeterias. And what we did was we increased the availability of lower-calorie food for main meals, sandwiches, snacks, and drinks. And this was done by stealth. We weren't advertising it. And we increased the availability of lower calorie and reduced the availability of higher calorie foods. The outcome was not individual. We just counted the number of calories that were sold in that cafeteria over a five-month period during the intervention. And... Uh, you'll see on the y-axis what we're, we're showing here is just the change in energy that was purchased, the change in calories. And if you just go to the far left-hand side, all sites combined in the orange bar is looking at the change. So over the period of the study across six sites, there was a reduction of almost 7% in the calories that were purchased across those six worksite cafeterias. Um, that's a large effect, a robust one. And we're now replicating that in 19 other worksite cafeterias and looking at the effect of reducing portion size as well. <laughs> so on to um, the one field study, and I'm going to ask you not to take photographs and not to tweet this because it's embargoed. Can you hold back? Um, so these are the results of... Um, 12-month studies, uh, lead author Emma Garnett, who's a PhD student of a group of ours in Cambridge. And what Emma did was she looked at a number of cafeterias. These were colleges across a year period, and we're looking at uh, nearly 90,000 meals. And you can see in the figure, every dot, it's hard to see, is a meal. On the x-axis, you've got the vegetarian availability and on the y-axis, you've got vegetarian sales. So these are just the, the proportion, the, the number of meals that are available that are vegetable-based, um, vegetarian-based, um, and their sales. So you can see uh, with vegetarian availability, uh, if you read across the x-axis, when it goes from 25% to 50%, so that is one in four meals offered being vegetable-based, uh, to two in four being offered being vegetable-based, you get an almost 70% increase in vegetarian sales. And there was no difference in the number of people who were using the cafeterias. So it wasn't that people went elsewhere. Um, so this is a, a very, um, this is a, an effect that we see across populations, and these are large effects to go for. I would emphasize, though, that when we talk about availability, it's the relative availability. We don't know what would happen if you're offering, say, three, three meat-based and one vegetarian meal, and then you just add more vegetarian meals. I think from other evidence that it's important that what you're doing is you're shifting uh, what's on offer away from that which you're wanting to reduce people from selecting. But there's an absence of evidence on that. Thank you.
Great. Um, I'm going to quickly hide that again. Um, so just going to do a quick few follow-up questions to that. Um, a few specific ones and a few general ones. So start with you, Teresa. I'm just curious, the mechanism behind this, is it simply that you're essentially changing the probability that the thing you will like is vegetarian? Or is there something more subtle going on there in that something to do with the way the choice set is offered might trigger some kind of heuristic towards one, one option over another, if that makes sense? It's a, it's a very good question, and it's important that we do understand the mechanism through which these effects are seen. And in, in my group, uh, we're very much focused on first get an effect and then try to understand the mechanism. And through understanding mechanism, you can optimise the effect. So I don't want to trivialise how hard it is to run these mm. studies. Um, so we've got several papers out now where we're discussing the potential mechanisms. And I think there are about four mechanisms that we've identified, two of which you've just mentioned, that may be operating when you shift availability. So one is probabilistic. If it's not there, then there's a 0% chance that you will select it. Um, in social psychology, there's, there's a phenomenon of the mere exposure effect. Mm. Um, so the mere fact that you're seeing something can increase the likelihood that you, that, that you will find it appealing. Uh, we think uh, another potential mechanism, all of these can be operating, uh, another potential mechanism is through uh, social norms. The fact that you see it in a public space uh, it increases the likelihood that you think, oh, well, it's there and therefore other people are likely to like it and we like to do what other people do. So we're doing lab studies to try to unpick some of these mechanisms. Yeah, great. Thank you. And Sophie, a specific question to you. I'm just going to skip back to one of your slides just to make sure I'm remembering this correctly. Um, but in your bottom three, you have offer only plant-rich dishes on main menus with meat-based dishes on request from a server or via separate menus. So you're essentially there talking about a default mm -hmm. where you're defaulting people into plant-based <coughs> options. I'm really surprised it's at the bottom because we do know that defaults yeah. can be really effective. Can you explain why that's... I think, you, why I think that's it's about taking um, into account the fact this is ranked by people who work in food service. So this is partly what they're willing to do. So it's about do. acceptability, yeah. not effectiveness. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's that about, that's the key yeah, point. It's about their perceive, how, how well they perceive that to work. And I think that probably what they might be conflating in that um, case is the, making the customer not happy. So I think they were really... Uh, all the approaches that make sense to a food service audience are one that they're already using that yeah. tap into marketing techniques and it's very pro-customer, pro-choice, give them what they want. So my feeling is that um, they were actually ranking that technique on the fact that it's very likely to be something that will get a lot of pushback. Um, yeah. So they're not going to touch it. Sure. <laughs> okay. And... Um Teresa, you started off by highlighting the sort of fundamental point of, of changing the environments we're in rather than trying to change the individual's mindset in order to shift their behaviour. And obviously that's a, a very common theme that emerges in all sort of applications of behavioural science. But just to offer, I guess, a, a, a bit of a, a probe into that, that, that sort of dichotomy, um, firstly, you've both highlighted with these particular studies and with the summary of your, your work, uh, Sophie, some quite specific sort of micro-environment type points. Um, so I guess an obvious question, is that enough? Is, is it possible or efficient to go around changing all the canteens and restaurants and menus in the world? Or if not, what are the sort of bigger levers through which we can change our environments that might have more of an impact? Um, Either of you. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so I was going to say, uh, as I said at the very beginning, there is no one in... The, the one thing to know is that there is no one yeah. thing. And uh, it is going to be multiple interventions. Um, so I, I'm, I've been talking about uh, micro-environment interventions. If you like demand side, there's also supply side and how those interact. Um, people often use the term nudge in a very... Uh, casual sloppy way and think that it means you don't need to regulate uh, I'm using it in a very specific way to mean a type of intervention and it doesn't tell you how you're going to achieve that intervention as Sophie has highlighted in commercial environments there's resistance to some effective interventions mm -hmm. so one of the levers that arguably needs very little policy and it's very underused is changing public sector environments why in a hospital, for instance, do we need to have any food that comes from ruminants? 
nothing terrible would happen. Um, and that's, that's, those are spaces over which we, in theory, have some control. So I think we've missed a trick, yeah. uh, certainly in terms of tackling obesity, for changing our um, public sector environments. I'm, I sit on a, a Scottish uh, government expert panel on single-use plastics, and Scotland is ahead of the curve here. So if you go into any uh, uh, Scottish government uh, office... There's no single-use plastic. And it takes a while to realise, God, it's sort of transformed the environments. So I think we could do do much more there. It's it's more difficult in a commercial space because I think often you'll need regulation. But I think that we aren't um, taking advantage of the fact that many of our environments are public sector. Um, And we could model what a sustainable food environment looks like. Yeah. And then you also sort of made the point that... um, you know, raising awareness of risk, etc., is often not enough. I expect you're going to give a, a, an equally sort of caveated response to this, but I'm curious, do we have enough evidence yet to know that in this space, merely raising awareness, either with a labelling system or a more generic awareness-raising education <coughs> approach, do we have enough evidence to say that's definitely not going to work, or is there potentially a bit of low-hanging fruit where actually... Because there is evidence, for example, to show that more people care about the environment than know about the meat issue. So there might be a segment of people who are motivated but don't have the knowledge yet. Or do we feel My counter to that would be some interesting studies that have looked at why environmentalists still eat meat. Yeah. Um, And they do. Um, So awareness of... And and it's not uh, that they're not aware of how change could occur for them personally. Um, so I think it's, it's important to do that. But if we want to see the large change, if we think about obesity, and there are, there are some overlaps there, um, we've had awareness campaigns in this country and many others for decades. And what's happened to obesity? I rest my case. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Um, and then finally, one question, again, to anyone on the panel, but I imagine Sophie or, or Theresa... Um, one question that came through quite a lot from audience members when I, when I canvassed the questions was how we avoid licensing effects. So is there a risk that if we successfully nudge someone towards more plant-based food in one environment, they feel like they've done their bit there, and then they're more likely to eat a steak when they go home or whatever in a different, different situation? And if that is a risk, is there anything we can actually do to sort of internalise that behaviour and, and habituate it so that doesn't happen? I would say that I d- certainly in study um, that Emma Garnett led on we looked at that and we didn't find so it was an, we didn't find evidence for that that people mm. who didn't have meat at lunch were going on to have more meat at dinner I mean that, that's not a particularly strong test but we didn't observe that and I think we have to be very careful about licensing effects we, we should look out for them um, but a lot of these these behaviours occur outside of awareness, and uh, the more evidence we have for that, then the less likely it becomes that there will be any self licensing that occurs. Mm. Yeah, great. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to move on to a slightly different theme now. So the next poll, we can make that live, please. So the question is. A major transition towards sustainable diets will be, on the whole, damaging for farmers and rural communities. Do you agree, disagree, or not sure, slash think there'll be sort of mixed impacts? Okay, well, there's still votes coming in, but it looks like disagree is pretty strongly in the lead there, which is encouraging, because my sense was actually that people do feel like the farming uh, sector is going to be an issue here because it will be damaging. So that's quite interesting. So we're going to come on and discuss that in a moment, but I'm immediately going to jump to one more poll, if I may. A related question. The agriculture sector, and in particular the meat industry lobby, are on average a barrier to progress towards sustainable diets. Do you agree, disagree, or don't know on that one? Interesting. Okay. (laughs) All right. So let's let's think about these issues um, with our panel for a few minutes. Then. So um, this is a sort of two-part question reflecting those those two polls. So I'm going to start off with Sue, if I may. So, firstly, 
based on the work that you've done and the research that you've done, do you believe that the transition, if there is a fairly substantive transition in, in national diet towards more plant-based uh, food, do you think that would be damaging to rural economies and the agricultural sector? Or do you actually see that they are a force for positive change and actually could benefit in some way from this as well? Well, like, like everybody else on this panel, the answer to that is uh, it depends. Yes. Uh, it depends on how it's done. And it depends on the extent to which we are able to design and implement what needs to be a fair and a just transition. Um, so there's a whole heap of stuff, I think, that um, we've talked about today, which um, I think deserves some scrutiny and, and some debate, and unsurprisingly. Mm. Um, so full disclosure, as you, as you said at the start, I am a farmer. And I'm a livestock farmer, and I'm an organic permaculture livestock farmer with an absolute um, commitment to um, farming uh, sheep and, and cattle, in my case, in a way that enhances the, um, the environment, the ecosystem, where I'm um, fortunate enough to live. So... Um, when we conducted our inquiry, the Food Farming and Countryside Commission, we, we looked at um, evidence around food and diets. We looked at evidence around farming and the enormous range of farming that exists across the sector. There is no one version of farming. There are many different types of farming, both in the UK and all around the world. But we also looked at the public's health. We also looked at the rural economy and rural communities. We looked at um, the broader issues of countryside and access to the countryside and the farmed countryside that we have in the UK. So we were keen to look across policy silos that often get um, disaggregated and treated um, in independently as if they do not have a material impact on each other, but also academic silos. Um, as, an, as an academic myself, I think I can also say, full disclosure, I'm fully aware that um, uh, as academics we get enormously passionate about things that, that we study and that we engage in. And we're not even very good at looking across our own, our own discipline, let alone to those disciplines that are far from our particular interests. So the purpose of the Commission was to take a whole systems view and to find the relationships and the connections between all of those topics which were within our, um, our purview. And then the other thing that we did, I think, that was distinctive and very interesting was that we looked very closely at the relationship between the top policy um, and and the bottom up, what's going on in communities and with citizens around the country. So we had a, we went around the UK on a bike, going out to people in their communities and having very simple and straightforward conversations with people where they are, not using policy speak, not using academic speak or consultation speak, but just engaging with communities in a very kind of ethnographic way to connect with people on the topics that were important to them. And that's what gave rise to our report. Um, and, and so what we, um, what we were able to reveal in our report is that, um, as I've already indicated, there are enormous variety of farmers. There are enormous varieties of perspectives within the farming community. And there are as many farmers. In fact, it, I, I could, instead of being here today, I could have been in Bristol at the Extinction Rebellion Farmers Meeting, mm -hmm. a group of which I am also a part. So there are as many farms. I'd have gone I along think, if I'd I think, known. I think, it was, I think it was a little bit quiet, but there's a, there's a WhatsApp group for the Extinction Rebellion farmers. So there are a group of people who are utterly committed to the huge global challenges of mitigating climate change, of responding to the ecosystems crisis, and also to do that in a way that supports people in rural communities and who see farming as a force for change and key to that future. So that gives an indication of how some of the kind of ways that we get caught in polarising and tribalist mm. conversations can prevent us from understanding the, the whole system. So we, in, in, in response to that question, farmers are part of the future and you know, farmers produce what we eat. You know, none of you would have had your lunch today if it hadn't been for farmers 
putting that work in. And the right kind of farming will indeed be a force for change. But that's the critical thing. Yeah. Have you got my quote there? The, I was going to bring that up yes. a little bit later, but if you want to talk I mean, about let's it. do it now, because I want to make the point. Okay. If you've got you it. To, I'm and I can, skip, I through, know a, skip so, through a bunch so of slides. So the, the World Health Organization um, this one. identifies that one of the greatest risks to planetary and human health is a poorly regulated global agri-food business. Now, one of the things that I am very curious about at the moment, and frankly very concerned about, is that the rush to um, commodifying plant-based diets and the rush to encouraging um, what I might call superficial veganism, the kind of, you know, the kind of hipster, oh, sorry, I'm yeah. being, but you know what I mean, yeah. um, is actually being driven and supported by the same global agri-food businesses that have done so much to have a really detrimental impact on planetary health and people's health. And it, they're producing... I mean, let, let's just go straight to the kind of... Um, you know, the shorthand. The ultra-processed food, the junk food, that is essentially poisoning people for profit is coming from that sector. Mm. So if we were moving towards... Um, diets that were plant-based because people are eating more fruit and vegetables and nuts and pulses because they are coming from local farmers in local food, food systems that are also sustaining rural communities, particularly in the UK, 70% of our land is farmed, then I'd feel somewhat differently about it. But I feel very disquieted that we're... Um, responding to really complex questions with many interconnected factors and ending up with what I think are really serious, unintended and unforeseen consequences that are not giving us what we want. Yeah. So I'll pause there for a Thank moment. Thank you. And yeah, I think it's a good segue in a way, that point about the sort of machinations of industry on, on all sides of the mm -hmm. debate um, links me to a point I want, I want to put to you, Kerry, um, which is that in your experience as a politician in particular, perhaps going back as well into your previous um, life as a lawyer and, and in campaigns and so on. Um, how do you perceive the, uh, the lobbying side of things? Is it a major barrier to policy, do you feel, or is it a valued input? I guess the, the answer is mixed, but, but how would you summarise that? And if it's not just that, what are the other major barriers you perceive to public policy in this issue? Um, yeah, it's difficult to know where to start. I think a lot of the lobbying is um, not overt. So whereas in America, I think you have um, some very high profile um, lobbying groups pushing these interests. I think in the UK, a lot more, yeah, well, certainly in the UK Parliament, um, it comes down simply to the fact that... Um, there's quite a lot of MPs that are farmers mm -hmm. or landowners, um, not so much, of, well, not at all, I think, on the, the, the <coughs> Labour side, but, you know, on the Conservative side and in the House of Lords. Um, so there's sort of vested interests, but also in terms of the circles they move in and representing rural constituencies, um, there's an influence that comes through there. But there's also, I think, more so, you know, and particularly amongst my colleagues, there seems to be, like, this fear <laughs> of how the public would respond um, and then that, that comes into the sort of tabloid media agenda, you know, they're trying to ban our bacon sandwiches and, you know, whatever. And I find that a lot where um, people are sort of presupposing, and we, we saw this with the Committee on Climate Change um, report recently, where Lord Deben, who was um, uh, sort of speaking in it, said we can't, I, I paraphrase slightly, um, but he said we can't expect people to start eating disgusting food, uh, by which he meant non-meat-based food. So therefore, in the recommendation, it's far more um, uh, moderate than a lot of the other proposals, um, including the IPCC and UN and WHO and all sorts of other people. So sort of 20% reduction in eating red meat, but switching mostly to pigs and poultry instead. And, you know, it's just incredibly disappointing. But he cited... Um, the, the sort of behavioural scientists on the basis this is the limits of what we can expect people to do mm. and um, I've asked him to sort of show me his workings on that because I just if you look at the massive rise in people moving to plant-based diets recently um, you know 
that doesn't bear it out and you know I, th- I think you could be far more ambitious as to what people would would do um and then I, th- I think also, so if you look, for example, at the Eat Well plate, which is meant to be used as a guide to things like public procurement and what healthy eating looks like, um, it, that is frustrating in that it's, it's there for information. And I go into schools often and it's pinned up on the walls and the children are taught about it, but it bears no reflection to what's actually served in terms of the meals. And, um, I, and again, that, that comes down to sort of a nervousness but also when the the eat well plate was updated in the last few years and there was a real kickback from the dairy sector because um uh non-dairy alternatives were included in the dairy section so if the first time it said actually you don't need to have eight percent of your diary as dairy the alternatives work as well yeah. so um I, I think yeah i'd say that the dairy and the red meat industry there there definitely is lobbying other sectors not not as much mm. but it's it's not necessary but a lot of it just comes down to like being sort of ridiculed and <laughs> you know when i was appointed uh, shadow secretary of state uh, the daily mail had a field day you know, having you put a vegan in charge of of farming policy and then I, I i could almost like have a scrapbook full of articles that they've run since then pointing out the benefits of plant-based yeah. diets and the popularity of it and yeah so uh yeah you just have to keep plugging on with that yeah yeah, yeah. and you raise there as well as obviously the um the influence of ministry but the perception of what people are willing to do is quite important lord devon's comments suggest there is a perception that people aren't going to be willing to to change that maybe perhaps perhaps underestimating yeah. our, our ability to change behaviour, um, which sort of, again, segues me nicely to the next um, sort of theme I wanted to bring up, which is around public consent. So we've got another poll for you, um, entering some slightly more contentious territory here, and the poll is, don't tell me what to eat. I dislike the idea of government influencing what I choose to buy and eat. So here we've got a <laughs> scale from strongly agree to strongly disagree. Ooh. Oh, that's confusing. Yeah. It's not going to keep them in the right order. <laughs> I don't think I dislike. I agree. So I don't agree. Again, we haven't exactly got a representative audience here. I imagine, <laughs> given the, the sector that we're all in here, we might be more willing for government intervention than the average. There's also a typo in. in Thanks. For, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for. <laughs> Much appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> That's why people are scrubbing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so clearly um, not, not totally yeah, either ambivalent or at least mixed feelings. Um, but as a, a related follow-up question to that, which I think is um, perhaps interesting for a slightly different reason, are we more comfortable with government nudging us or otherwise influencing us towards certain food choices which are more sustainable, are you better for the planet, or more healthy, better for yourself, or are you about equally content with the idea of intervention on those uh, angles? Again, we have a very atypical audience here, but this is quite interesting. So there is that, that's actually counter to some evidence that does exist in the literature, which suggests that actually we're more accepting of nudges which are pro-self, i.e. for our own benefit, i.e. for our health, than we are of nudges which encourage us to do things that are pro-social, i.e. for other people's benefit or for society's benefit. So you're kind of, you know, there's quite a bit about the same there, but on the other two, you're kind of the opposite, which I imagine just simply reflects that this audience is very much in the sustainability sector. But I think that's, that's quite interesting nonetheless, because the, the, the results in the literature do rather imply that self-interest, for lack of a better term, is quite important. We're happy for government to do stuff if it's in our own interest. A little bit less happy for government to influence us in order to encourage us to do things in other people's interest. So that's, um, I think, quite interesting. Um, but again, let's have a few questions for our panel to sort of dig into some of those themes. So, um, firstly, I want to go back to either Theresa or Sophie and think about the behavioural science again. What behavioural factors impede sort of bold policy measures here? Is there a sense to which we are innately averse to change or averse to influence? Or perhaps there's a bit of sort of status quo bias going on there? The two slides that I had either I'm going to come to that in a moment. Oh, okay, yeah, because so that answers the question. Okay, well, let's maybe start off with Sophie, if you've got anything to say to this. Like, what, what are the sort of perhaps biases or other behavioural factors that maybe 
cause us to be um, averse to some kind of change. You know, so. I mean, that's kind of not really my area. Okay. <laughs> but um, I would think there's a big status quo bias thing going on, especially with diets. They're so habitual with food behaviour. I think that you're, you're going to really struggle to get people to understand what the change needs to be and what that's going to look like. And we have quite a... Um, set way of seeing meals with meat at the centrepiece of a meal um, so it's almost about changing the entire structure of the way we're eating really so I think that um, it'd be good if we had somebody to put forward what that new concept would look like I think to be able to push past that okay and Teresa I'll come to your slides in a moment but just to, to go to Sue so again we, we spoke about this a little bit um, over email and there's a sort of interesting um, perhaps irony that we do sometimes seem quite averse to government intervention, particularly in our diets, and yet industry is clearly doing a huge amount to influence what we choose to buy and eat. So you had a, you had a second quote, which I put up on the screen now, but maybe you could just talk a bit about that and, and how you perceive that. Yes, so we're often told, and we're often told by policymakers that they really don't want to be seen to be telling people what to do. And you might remember that when Dame Sally Davis talked about um, her, I think it was the sugar tax, um, she was given a really hard time by John Humphreys on Radio 4 Today programme about turning into the nanny state. So we'll, we'll set aside the gender component of that particular debate for a moment. But that, um, that challenge, you know, we, we don't want to create a nanny state, is a very easy default challenge to make. But of course it does not um, take account of the fact that we are being told what to eat over and over and over again um, in very covert ways, in really sophisticated ways by people who, let's say, generously, possibly do not have necessarily the best interests of um, customers at, at their heart. They have other motivations. And this is a quote that we use in the report. Um, the advertising, UK advertising around junk food brands is 20... 27 and a half times, I think it's, it's something like £258 million pounds on junk food um, in that particular year compared to £5 million pounds on the government's flagship public health campaign. And that's not even to take into account all of the new and incredibly subtle ways that um, uh, food processors, food producers have to persuade us through new forms of media, through social media, through Instagram, through influencers. And, and that's the kind of issue that I think we have to confront more seriously. I mean, Kerry was saying that she, her experience has been lobbied by um, the kind of meat and dairy folk. We have been lobbied so hard by the sugar sector mm. in, in, in actually very revealing and possibly, you know, potentially quite scary ways. You know, doing things like going right back through, you know, one's internet history and letting letting me know that they were able to do that and calling attention to the fact that you know talking about vegans you know people not eating meat but you know if you're going to make these recommendations let me know how often you're flying won't you and so really letting one know that we're being scrutinized um, for any recommendation that might challenge their particular view of the world um, so that gave me a bit of insight into the way the lobbying world works in ways that I wasn't um, expecting, but was absolutely fascinating. Now, from my point of view, given that I think it is really important we take a systemic, interconnected and balanced perspective across food, across farming, across rural communities, across public health and across the, um, the ecosystem of um, farmland and land, I've been more inclined to take issue with the, um, global food businesses whose growing practices and who, you know, whose vertical integration exercises high degree of control, not just over the method of production, but also what we consume and how we consume it. That's a story that is largely invisible in this debate. And it needs to be brought back in as one of the banks of evidence that we take into account when we start making judgments about which policies we choose to pursue, why we choose to, the, to pursue them, and what effect that policy is likely to have across a broad range of considerations. Yeah. 
So clearly we do have a degree of inconsistency in our appetite for influence from different entities, mm -hmm. and maybe there is just something we sort of hold sacred about a government that shouldn't be as influential as we sort of expect it from industry to some extent. Do we expect um, it or we just don't know? Or well, we don't know, yes. But there's well, a very, just, yeah. just to pick up on what Sue's saying, there's a very strong narrative um, that is that often comes from industry that serves their purpose. I mean, not all industry, um, but we've seen this. It's been studied most over the decades from the tobacco industry. Mm -hmm. So promoting the idea of individual choice yeah. uh, rather than nanny state. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, you know, it feels like the devil often has the best tunes. And people have tried very hard to get yes. a counter-narrative. Yes. Um, and thinking about price-based interventions, yes. yeah. they tend not to be popular mm -hmm. uh, amongst policymakers and uh, 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 related to the fact they're not popular with the public. But there is good evidence that people will trade off a dislike of an intervention for a perceived benefit. So thinking about the sugar tax, um, my group had a paper published yesterday called the snack tax, um, looking modelling what the impact would be of a 20% increase on biscuits, cakes and chocolates. And what these taxes or levies are attempting to do is to impose the full economic costs on these products which are picked up out of the public purse um, but the profit is going into the private purse. So we need to get smarter about our narratives. Absolutely. And we were very strong on that in our report. We yeah, talked about sure. the whole... The, 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 full, the full cost of food. And I think that individuating narrative is really critical. I found, and, and pa perhaps the panel will be able to um, affirm this or otherwise, I found it much stronger in the UK and the US, um, but in particularly in the Nordic countries, there's a much more communitarian culture anyway. Mm. And so people are, in my experience, more likely to balance... Um, if you like, communitarian concerns against that individuating narrative because it's more deep-rooted in their, in their national culture. But in, in cultures which have strong individuating narratives, then it's, it's a tougher sell. Mm. I think that's actually right. I mean, if you look at the whole sort of Brexit debate and the idea of taking back control and we're not quite like the other Europeans, and um, I, I think that's a very strong narrative. And... Um, the whole nanny state thing that you said about. I think probably going back to what was said before about the lobbying thing, there was very strong lobbying. I was in Parliament when the smoking ban in public places was introduced. Very strong lobbying then and quite aggressive in terms of uh, mobilising smokers to send me. I put up a blog post and had no idea that... The, I think it was an organisation called Freedom to Choose or something like that, but they t alerted people. And I was suddenly sitting there, my e inbox went crazy. There were hundreds and hundreds of emails directed. So there's, there was clearly a mechanism there. The sugar tax, you saw it, but more from much more from the industry. They didn't mm -hmm. mobilise the public in the way that I think the Americans do quite a lot of. But we haven't reached that critical point where legislation is really being considered mm. at the moment because the government's agenda tends to be pretty hands-off. Yeah. So there's... There's quite a lot of anger if you try to raise these issues in Parliament. There will be, like, the farmers come along to debates on the agriculture bill. There'll be quite a bit of pushback. But it hasn't reached that point where they really... At the moment, what the industry is worried about is the way consumers are responding and the way the market's responding. So they're pushing back against that. There's not a legislative thing that they've got to be worried about at this point. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. And so... Teresa, you, you've got a few slides more to the, I guess, the question of how can we make policy more palatable, more acceptable. Yeah. Um, I think that would be a nice sort of theme to finish on, so be happy yeah. to maybe present those. So just quickly, really, uh, picking up on some of what uh, we've just been talking about, there was um, a, a Lancet Commission report that was published at the beginning of this year that I would recommend to everybody um, uh, introducing to many of us a new concept of syndemic. You, you've heard about epidemics, but a syndemic, even worse, where they all come together. Uh, and this is obesity, undernutrition, and climate change, and very much focused on the policies which overlap in terms of what could be done. And I think this, this captures uh, what we've been uh, alluding uh, uh, towards, which is um, policy inertia. So we've got an amount of evidence. Of course, we still need more, but we've got an amount of evidence 
that needs to be implemented in policy, nationally and internationally, to make the shifts that we're talking about. And that's not happening. And three uh, barriers are identified, which we've just touched on. Um, the first, uh, this is from the paper, inadequate political leadership and governance to enact policies. So don't let's go there, but uh, I think we all know what, uh, what, what, what this means. And it's, it's a major, this is a global uh, analysis. The other, which we've just been hearing about, which is strong opposition to policies by powerful, and they are powerful, commercial interests. So not all commercial interests are against this, but there are some very powerful ones that are lobbying. And then finally, a lack of demand for policy action by the public. And it's that that I want to focus on in my last slide, because I think that Possibly, you know, one needs action on all three, but the public voice <coughs> is probably one where we may get more traction, and it may be that policymakers, certainly in the UK, might begin to start articulating that which is being whispered in the corridors of DEFRA um, <coughs> about uh, ruminants and their products and the need to do something about it. Um, so... Um, thinking about uh, public uh, public opinion and what might what might be done, um, what we know is that uh, people are sensitive to evidence, rather like us in this room, possibly more so than policymakers. Uh, although, having said that, policymakers are very sensitive to evidence about what the public thinks. So that is one piece of evidence, which I think is absolutely key. So I'm just going to end with one final slide, and this is a systematic literature review that we've uh, recently completed, which is in <laughs> press, where we looked at experimental evidence for communicating evidence of policy effectiveness to publics. And we looked at any, any policy area, but it, it so happened that the majority were in health, so 20 of the experiments were in health. So one group is told about a policy, um, another group is told about a policy and how effective it might be in improving health or the environment. That was uh, nine of them and seven in other areas. So gun control, education being just some examples. So when, when these were um, synthesized in, uh, uh, in meta-analysis, what we found was that when people are either told that there's evidence of effectiveness or shown the evidence, that that increased their support for the effective policies by an estimated 4%. Um, so 4% might not sound like very much, um, but as we all know, referenda and presidential elections have been won on less. I should also say that um, some of the studies looked at providing evidence of ineffectiveness, and we got a similar effect size. So people are sensitive both to evidence of effectiveness and evidence of ineffectiveness. Um, now, of course, that's, a, as, as I've said right at the beginning, uh, more than one intervention is needed. This, I, I think that, uh, that, that, that there's more potential uh, for um, thinking about in publics and how to engage them. It's an under-evidenced area, and it's an under-theorized area. So for those of you who are interested in this area, I just encourage you to be doing more work here because I think the engagement of publics and its plural is going to be absolutely key to shifting uh, the change that's needed. Thank you very much. And we've seen school children actually being the loudest voices more recently, right. so we need more of that. Thank you. And I'm sure we could talk about that point for some time longer, but actually we've only got about seven minutes left, and I want to move on to something slightly different. This wouldn't be BX if you weren't doing experiments on you, um, and we have been doing experiments on you. So I'm going to hand over to a colleague of mine just to uh, summarise the results of a little trial that we've been running over the last couple of weeks. Hi, so my name's Abby. I work on Predictive, which is the online experimentation platform that we have at BIT. And... Some of you may remember that you got an email asking you um, about your food preferences. Um, hands up if anyone remembers receiving the email. Maybe, yeah, great. Um, so I'll just go through this quite quickly because I think we're out of time. But um, yes. Yeah. 
Um, so basically, we sent it to anyone who didn't have um, special dietary requirements. So this was everyone that's meat eaters, effectively. Um, so of 664 delegates, we had 404 who responded. And um, everyone got to select their food choice, but what you didn't know was it was an RCT that we were running on predictive. So half of you saw one menu and half of you saw another. So you didn't see the same menu design. So the first group of people saw the following menu. So we had con uh, conventional terms for meat-free and vegetarian, as you would normally expect to see on a menu. So like meat-free steamed dumplings and ordinary vegetarian names. So uh, hummus with tomato and peppers on bread. Um, and we had really indulgent meat and fish names to make you want to pick those, like the seasonal fish. Um, don't really know what the fish is in season right now, but there we go. Um, and we had the vegetarian items were segregated on the menu, so you can see meat and fish really clearly and vegetarian separately, um, because meat eaters don't normally want to look at the vegetarian, um, the vegetarian dishes. Um, and I, I don't think you can actually see it on this screen, but the background was an image that was meaty, so it was um, the chicken skewers in the background. Whereas the second group of people saw um, a different menu. So we added a sentence about um, in an effort to be more sustainable um, to the start and to kind of highlight that we were reducing food waste. Um, we avoided terms like vegetarian and meat free so that you didn't think you were missing out on something um, and added um, more indulgent terms like field grown, uh, freshly baked bread, things like that. Um, and we made the meat items ordinary um, so just fish with mayo. Um, we, we integrated the vegetarian dishes and put them first on the menu, so they're the first thing you see. Um, and we also made the background image vegetarian, so it was a salad. So I'm going to present the results. So this was the effect. Um, so this is the control versus the treatment menus. And what you can see there is there's a 23% increase in the proportion that selected um, the percentage of vegetarian dishes that were selected from the menu, so out of the eight options that they had. Um, so yeah, quite a big effect. Even though it's kind of a kitchen sink approach because we didn't know how many people would actually respond, you can see that this is quite a massive effect. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. I believe we're out of time. Um, so it just leaves to say thank you so much to our panel. If you wouldn't mind joining me uh, in a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.